Hey, I want to welcome everybody to our MS News and News first educational program in the state of Massachusetts. And I'm glad that all of you could attend today. And I'm also very glad that we have our online audience because that always means a lot from event to event. So <clears throat> to start off today's program, we are going to be, this is a Compass MS Care program. We are sponsored by EMD Serono, Sandoz, Novartis, Banner, Genentech, Biogen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Santa Fe. So I do want to thank them, and I hope you all can thank them as well. Clap, clap, clap. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> all right, we had exhibitors today. We had exhibitors outside greeting the audience coming in of Banner Life Sciences, Alexion, and Bristol-Myers Squibb, and I'm glad that everybody could be here and to give the information that you could, the resources, to those attending this program. Our nurse practitioner locally is Lynn Stazone. Mm. Lynn is a nurse practitioner at the Brigham and Women's MS Center in Boston, working there for a very long time. How long? We'll find that out in a few minutes. She sees her own panel of patients and has a strong interest in symptom management. And that is what she's gonna be speaking about today. So without further ado, let's have Lynn Stazzoni, come up to the stage. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I want to say thank you because this is super exciting because for like the past two plus months, years, I haven't been able to speak in front of people. So it's really wonderful that you've let me do this. Thank you, Stuart, for asking. Okay, so this is the agenda. I am a nurse practitioner. I'm also a clinical nurse specialist in neuro rehab. And I've been working at the Brigham a long time, and if I say how long, it makes me old, feel old, so I'm not gonna say exactly, but. Um, so I'm gonna go over some treatment symptoms with a heavy focus on fatigue and depression, because honestly, I could spend hours on each symptom alone. So I just sort of picked out fatigue and depression because they are one of the most common symptoms of people with MS uh, experience. Then I'm gonna go over some shared decision making and then uh, sum it all up. So I think Paul had sort of mentioned this when he was talking that I think when you get a diagnosis of MS, it really is such a diagnosis of, of being like uncertainty. And that's really the hallmark of the disease because you just never know when that other shoe is gonna drop. And it, it can plague someone and you're always thinking about it. But I see Control of it as the antidote. So how do you control this? One way is through symptom management and through disease modification. So it can allow you to feel a little more control. And I think by doing that, one builds on resiliency. And this is what I loved about your talk, Paul, that people have so much capacity to do the things that they need to do. And they can do it, but sometimes it gets so bogged down that you forget about that. So I think the focus of MS care is to treat attacks, to slow or modify the progression, to treat symptoms, uh, manage comorbidities. MS is not the only thing that's going to land on your lap. As we age or maybe you get in a car accident or something, there's going to be other things besides MS that you have to deal with. And you have to deal with at the same time you're dealing with MS. And then my... my what I consider the most important thing is to enhance the quality of life. Because if you don't have quality of life, what, what do you have, right? So treating exacerbations. People often will say to me, well, when do I call you? In the beginning, I always say, call me whenever. You know, until you learn that maybe sometimes that tingling that you have in the tip of your finger that only lasts for a half an hour, you don't need to call about. But if a symptom is around for a while, at least a couple days, then I'd say give your provider a shout. So if you do have symptoms, depending on what they are, they often can be treated with steroids. Now people, to me, like if someone has numbness or tingling, it's not really a bothersome symptom, I'd say no, don't go for the steroids. You know, because steroids do have their side effects. But if it's really bothersome, then it's worth trying the steroids. So then the one of the things to give you more of a sense of control is to slow the progression. And this can be done through so many different venues now, and I'll go into some of it later. But, you know, when I first started in this, there were no medications for MS. And really, people were told, there was a saying, diagnose and adios, because 
people were diagnosed, but there really wasn't any treatments that could be done and, and very little symptom management. Uh, but now there are so many things that are out there. And here is this laundry list of everything that is available. And to me, it's like super overwhelming. There's just so much out there, um, not only as the person with MS to have to de decide, along with your provider, what to take, but also just to go through all the side effects and all, you know, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. And for me as a provider, it's overwhelming to go through all the potential side effects and how to monitor somebody when they're on these medications. So as you can see, I think someone had mentioned, I don't know, maybe it was Sherry, like in 1993, she said I was the first drug I was on. So obviously she was on beta serin because that was the first drug that came out. And over the years, there have been more and more that have been become available, which I think is really great. Choices are always good. So you can look at drugs, um, like break them down into, and how you would choose. And this is going to be important when I talk about shared decision making later on, because you really need to buy into what you want to do or not do, actually. So you can look at how a drug is delivered. Maybe you don't want to take a medication that you have to take every day orally, or a medication that you have to take twice a day. Or you don't want to inject, no way, you're not going to do it. So it's pointless to say, oh yeah, that's a good drug for me, and then not do it because you can't inject. And then there are infusions that are um, possible. People say, I don't want to go to an infusion center, I don't want to sit there for six hours, and so on and so forth. You can also look, how are they classified? Is the drug, what's their mechanism of action? You know, some work by modulating the immune system, some work by what are called anti-trafficking, and some work by depleting certain uh, agents in the body. So what about looking at their side effects? That's another way to look at a drug. And I, I put this up here not to be specific about each particular drug, but to look at that every drug has different side effect profile, and this is something that should be considered in what I'm gonna talk about a little bit later in shared decision making. And then efficacy, also super important. How efficacious is a particular drug? And balance that out with the potential side effects. Like I said, I wasn't putting this up to like identify each individual agent, but just to point out that every drug has a different particular efficacy rate. So I'm just going to show a brief video from the American Cancer Society about biosimilars and generics, really. Understanding biosimilars. Biological medicines, often called biologics, are an important class of drugs that offer safe and effective treatment options for many diseases, including cancer. Unlike most drugs, which are made through chemical reactions, biologics are made by living cells. Antibodies are an example of a biologic. Standard drugs are made up of chemically identical molecules. But because of the size and complexity of biologics, these kinds of medicines can include subtle molecular variations. They have extremely small differences, even between lots of the same medicine. Given their source, this is normal, expected, and controlled within very tight limits. Think of it this way. Wine made from grapes is a biologic product. Grapes have slight differences from year to year or even from field to field, even when from the same vineyard, like a biologic. Bottles of sport drink, on the other hand, are always identical being derived from a fixed recipe of uniform ingredients, like a standard drug. So now that we know what a biologic is, what is a biosimilar? The simplest answer is that a biosimilar is a copy of another biologic. You're probably familiar with generic drugs or generics, which are copies of standard brand drugs. Generics are approved by the FDA by showing that they are chemically identical to the brand name drug or reference product. Given that they are exact copies, we already know the active ingredient is safe and effective. Biosimilars are like generics in that they are versions of brand name biological medicines made by a different manufacturer, just like generics are versions of standard brand name drugs. However, unlike generics, it is impossible to make exact copies of biologics. Remember wine? Instead, 
biosimilars must demonstrate to the FDA that they are highly similar to an existing biologic that has already been shown as safe and effective through extensive clinical trials. If biosimilars aren't exact copies, will they work the same? Yes, all biosimilars must be proven to have no clinically meaningful differences compared to the reference product, and this involves some clinical trials. So why do we have biosimilars? Biosimilars increase competition and choice and help treat diseases like cancer, arthritis, Crohn's, diabetes, MS, and others. Also, because biosimilars can rely on some of the work done to approve the reference biologic, similar to generics, there are fewer additional expensive clinical trials needed for FDA approval, which in turn leads to more affordable products. Since they work the same but cost less, a biosimilar may be the first choice of your physician or healthcare plan. The other way you might encounter a biosimilar is that your pharmacist may select it as a less expensive substitute for the brand name biologic on your prescription. However, your pharmacist can only do this if the biosimilar has been designated as interchangeable with its reference product by the FDA based on additional clinical studies, and your doctor allows such substitutions. Regardless of whether you receive a biosimilar from your physician or your pharmacist, the bottom line is that biosimilars offer safe, effective, and potentially less expensive treatment alternatives for patients. So I bring this up um, once I, I was asked to bring it up, but I, I think it when sometimes when we're faced with talking to your provider about medications, it gets so confusing because there's generics, there's biosimilars, there's bioavailability drugs. So I think we need to have an understanding that all of them have to do pretty much similar things in the body. So if something is potentially cheaper or more cost effective, it might be the way to go. Um, so I'd like to just move on to talk. I was charged with trying to bring up newer, some newer medications since 2020, um, but certainly I can talk about some of the other ones if anyone has questions at the end. I really like that tape too because it had wine as an example. <laughs> okay, some of the newer disease modifying treatments. So in order to talk about some of the newer ones, I have to kind of bring up the older one, and that is Gelenia or Fingolimod, which is an S1P receptor um, mediator. So how this particular drug works is by sequestering lymphocytes that normally circulate through the bloodstream, keeps them in the lymph nodes, so less of a chance of them migrating into the central nervous system. Fingolimod or Gelenia, I don't know if you can see, it. there are five different receptor sites on different parts of our body, and fingolimod works on four of those receptor sites. So um, that's why the potential for side effects. Whereas some of the newer agents work on less of the receptor sites. Plus there might be a direct effect in the CNS as well with an S1P. So here are the four S1P modulators, and once again, a busy slide, so I apologize for that. And I put this up here just to show you that, like I said, the Fingolimod um, Gelenia was the first generation, and since then there have been three more. Pretty much have similar pre-screening, and um, I I'll go into differences in a second, but, um, the newer one, Azanamod or Symposia, I think there's a Symposia person out here. Okay, right, if you have further questions about it. Um, so the, when I was talking about those receptor sites, there's, it only affects two separate receptor sites in the body, which potentially can mean less side effects. Um, but honestly, this one and the next one I'll talk about, I wonder how much of it is really the receptor site versus how the titration was set up. That um, Maybe that's where fingolimod could have done it differently. Um, so for these, all of the S1Ps, you have to have certain blood screenings done, such as CBC, LFTs, looking if you've had exposure to chicken pox or a VZV titer, um, an ophthalmology exam to check the macula behind the eye, and then definitely an EKG. 
this particular drug, um, you have to be careful if you're on an antidepressant or an SSRI. Um, there can a possibility of what's called serotonin syndrome. Uh, obviously, with you went on any pre-existing cardiovascular conditions or a sleep obstru uh, a obstructive sleep apnea. I didn't know this about this drug, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't know that with the fin um, there are certain foods that you shouldn't eat with it, uh, high fatty foods, um, and those would be um, foods that contain tyramine, so dried meats, sausage, wine, here I bring up the wine again, um, cheeses, um, tofu, soy sauce, and beer from a tap. I guess that's how it's fermented. But So you have to be careful with this that you don't do any of that. Um, and the next one is panas panasamad or panvoy. Do we have somebody doing that one out here? Nope? All right. You have no competition. <laughs> so this particular, it only uh, goes at one particular uh, site, one SP1, uh, one S1P site. So once again, maybe that does present with less side effects in general, but I don't really know, but the titration is different. So with the one previous and this one, um, the titration takes a longer time to build up, so less potential cardiac side effects like lower heart rate uh, with the first observation dose. All of them are really pretty effective uh, when we talk about efficacy, I would say, in my mind, about 48 to 50 percent effective compared to placebo. So some of the unique features, and I'm just going to talk about the Sazanamad, is they did some trials that will look like it had maybe some cognitive benefit. Um, and then the Panasamad had uh, showed a significant reduction in fatigue, which, you know, is really significant. Um, and then fingolimod is the only one approved uh, for children uh, ages 10 and above for, for right now. Then looking at um, the fumarates, um, the first one that came out was Tecvidera, and they don't really know how it works, but there's a thought that it does um, lessen in inflammation and kind of function as an antioxidant, and that's its mechanism of action. Um, it, I don't know if anyone's on there, on this out there, but it can cause uh, some stomach upset, pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, flushing of the face, um, and so there is a titration dose for this. So this drug, you do have to monitor certain things, and along with the S1Ps and this one as well, there is a small risk of a PML, which is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So a newer version of this is Vumerity, um, which converts, so Tecvidera or dimethylfumarate converts to monomethylate in the body. All you need to know, it's, it works like it's a bioavailable drug. So it's not a biosimilar because it's chemically made, but it's bioequivalent. Bio and um, so this one, you can eat... Um, it's interesting, so with Tecvidera, the first one that came out, they suggested people eat high fatty food in order to mitigate some of the symptoms. With Vumerity, you actually don't, you wanna eat it with food, but you don't want it to have a high fat content. So it gets a little confusing, um, but this is what you would really have to discuss with your provider before you choose to take it. And what the high fat does, it can potentially can reduce the effectiveness of the drug. And then the newer one, and I know that's you, and I always say it wrong, Banf Banfertam? Befertam, okay, there we go. Um, which is monomethylate fumarate right from the beginning. It doesn't have to break down in the body. Uh, so potentially less side effects, but once again, there's a titration dose to build up in your system. Um, and once again, it's bioequivalent to the Tecvidera. So all of those do the same thing in the body. And then the la last one to come out is, Sherry had mentioned these anti-CD20 drugs is Kesimpta or Ofatumumab. 
So that works the same as ocrelizumab or rituxan by depleting B cells in the system. So B cells help your T cells to function normally to keep your body, your immune system going. But so if you suppress the B cells, the B cells are not there to help the T cells. So you get um, a really potent, it's about 80, 85% efficacy rate. It is administered subcutaneously once a month. So once again, going back to choices, some people just can't do an injection. It's a really nice little auto injector, but they just can't do it versus being on an IV anti-CD20, which is given uh, once every six months. So people often talk about the risk of PML. There's always a risk of PML with any of the anti-CD20 drugs. So far, I don't think there's been any cases on key symptom. So this is what I love to talk about as symptoms. So what, this, how, what happens? There, there's an inf inflammatory response in the body. People get a symptom, and that's how they come out. Or they could be left over from scarring. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm having a flare-up. It's really not technically, in some cases, a flare-up. It's just that your old symptoms is rearing its ugly head. So you're overtired. You have an infection. That numbness and tingling in your hand is going to increase. It's not a new symptom, but it's going to be an old symptom from some scarring. And there's definitely different uh, ways to manage every symptom. So what are the symptoms? Here are the most common MS symptoms. And I hate putting this up here because it sounds like this negative laundry list, but it really is possible. And, and you know, sitting in a room full of people, not one, two people in the same room have the same symptoms. They might have some in common, but it's not gonna be all the same. And I'm gonna focus on fatigue and depression, which happen to be two of the most common symptoms of MS. Then the less common are these. Um, I have a little repeats in there, I'm sorry, but a Lormite sign, you know, you bend your head forward and you get this electrical sensation down your arms, so that's what that is. Um, ataxia is just more like incoordinated movements and then tremors would be more like just shaking. Vertigo or the room spinning and then seizures, which are pretty rare. So let me talk about fatigue. I'm going to quote this because this comes from medical journals. A feeling of physical tiredness or lack of energy out of proportion to the level of exertion. A subjective lack of physical or mental energy that is perceived to interfere with usual and desired activities. So how do people with MS describe this? I often hear one of the biggest things is brain fog. I just can't think, I can't process information, I'm just so tired. Um, lack of motivation or muscle weakness, I'm, I'm physically fatigued. Um, inability to complete a task, can't perform at work that well, trouble sleeping. So this is where I usually ask the audience, and I don't think Stuart would approve, that, um, you know, how do they experience fatigue? But maybe later on, you can, if you choose, share your experience and how you would define fatigue, especially if you're trying to convey it to somebody who doesn't have MS. Because I got to tell you, I once talked with somebody who said, you know, I was talking to my girlfriend and she said, I said, oh man, I'm so tired. And my girlfriend said, so am I. And she said, oh, she has no idea what my fatigue is, because it's way different than you who just exercised and worked out and went out for dinner, and now you're tired. So um, it's, it's not the same. So how do you, how do you distinguish it? You know, how, what is the difference between fatigue for someone who doesn't have MS and one who does? Often worse in time uh, by heat. It, it prevents sustained activity. I don't know if any of you have done the time 25 foot walk when you get examined. Some people say I'm great at 25 feet, but catch me going another 75 and I'm done. I, I'm just physically tired. So it comes on easily. It doesn't gradually come on. It's not often relieved by rest, or it can be. And it can change from day to day. 
So it is one of the most common symptoms, as I said earlier. Uh, over 50% of the people over the lifetime of the disease get fatigue, and it's not dependent on level of disability, how old you are, what sex you happen to be, uh, and it is unfortunately poor, poorly understood. Um, but there really is a direct correlation between fatigue, depression, and anxiety. So what causes it? There are some theories, um, and I'm gonna go over a few of those theories. But think about how one who has MS has a hard time describing how the fatigue is for them. Think about just if we don't even know what really causes it, and we know that it's multifactorial. It isn't just one particular reason that causes it. So looking at structural damage that there is, there was a study where they compared people who have MS and fatigue, people who have MS and people who don't have MS and have fatigue. And they found that people with MS who have fatigue have um, a little more atrophy in their brain and they have micro structural damage versus macro structural, so small little damaged areas where there might be a reason for why there is fatigue. So another theory is inflammation. Um, so somehow there's um, this pro-inflammatory response which interf interferes with normal circadian rhythm. And this is due to um, inflammation. And it's connectly, closely connected to what they call the innate immunity system where inflammation kind of is protective. So it makes you want to rest. It makes you want to slow down and regenerate. Um, there's also a, th a part of this is that cytokines that are released, that they release these neurotransmitters that are interfere with um, and cause inflammation. And then we know that microglia is really important in MS, and it's, what, it's a, um, an inflammatory mediator in the central nervous system, and it affects direct cells like the oligodendrocyte and astrocytes, and, and which is involved in cell function. So basically what I'm saying is inflammation just kind of slows everything down. And then another theory is connectivity. So if you have lesions in your brain and the brain has to bypass them or work around them, that it causes the brain to work harder. So that is why it's thought that it's fatiguing, because the brain really has to turn out a lot of energy. So it's a maladaptive networking system. So how do people quantify fatigue? And this is like providers, how do you, how do you say someone's fatigue or more fatigue or less fatigue, or how do you measure if fatigue improves? And there are scales out there that do this. Honestly, this is not something that most clinics can do routinely because it's very time consuming. So you might see more of this in trials, clinical trials. But really importantly is to rule out secondary causes. I can't tell you how many times people say they're fatigued and their primary care doctor says, well, go talk to your MS specialist. You know, it's, it's your MS. Well, not everything is MS. So it could be that you have sleep apnea. So you're up all night or you have urinary uh, issues and you're voiding three or four times at night. You have spasticity or bio, you know, restless leg syndrome and you don't get quality of sleep, you're gonna be tired the next day. You're depressed or sad or anxious, you can't turn your brain off. You're thinking a mile, 100 miles a minute and can't sleep. So, and, and if you can take care of those, it might actually take care of the fatigue. Um, certain medications, and certainly many that we use, can cause fatigue. People who are on um, neuropathic stimulator, uh, like gabapentin, or Neurontin can be very fatiguing. Baclofen, an antispasmodic drug, I'm telling you, take care of your spasms, but can also cause fatigue. Um, heat, know that if you over, most people in the heat, although I do see a few people who say they thrive in the heat, but usually heat will slow down conduction. Um, deconditioning, Sherry had mentioned, which is so true, exercise, super duper important. So people who don't exercise 
I think are going to feel more fatigue and less stamina. How we eat, you know, there's a lot of controversy about diet and MS, but eating healthy, your machine has to work. So if you live off of Taco Bell or Chick-fil-A, it's not going to be as healthy as if you eat really nutritious foods. And then the biggest thing is the systemic diseases. So thyroid disease, especially in women, uh, is more common as we age. So your hypothyroid, you're going to feel really tired and wiped out. And that might be why you have fatigue and not MS. And then anemia can also contribute to that sort of touched on this already, what do you do? You have to treat these underlying reasons and maybe you'll have less fatigue in the end. So I call this the peanut butter and jelly fatigue sandwich because my point is that any one particular activity can, can really zap someone of their energy. So it's like to make a sandwich, you have to organize. You have to go to the cupboard, go to the refrigerator, go to the silverware drawer. So any activity can be overwhelming and fatiguing unless you try to really organize what you do. So that's why it's important to organize and time conserve. You know you, know, you know you need supplies and you're gonna carry it or you're gonna wheel it somewhere. Collect them all together and pacing yourself. Uh, I clearly remember this patient taught me that if she had was going out to dinner with friends that evening, she didn't do much during the day. She really conserved her energy to, enable, to be able to do that. And vice versa, if she had many things that she did during the day, she knew she couldn't go out at night. I think set realistic goals. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I have so much energy and do 12 things because they got that energy, but then they're totally wiped out for the next three or four days. So really setting uh, realistic goals. Allow for rest periods. Um, and then exercise once again. And sometimes people will say, well, I'm so tired. How could I possibly exercise? But if you just start that little goal and work up, it really does build. I just saw someone this week in clinic who said, I know, I didn't believe you, but I, I did start to exercise and I really do feel so much better. So a lot of people pride themselves on not using walking or assistance to get somewhere. But honestly, it takes so much energy to get where you want to go that you're wiped out by the time you get where you want to go. Um, at a patient, I don't remember. This was when I was in graduate school. And he was talking to us. I, I don't know. He had MS. He wasn't even doing MS work back then. But he said he prided himself on not having to take a wheelchair or one of those carts at the airport to the gate because he didn't want to be known as handicapped. Um, and so he would get to where he was going, he would have to give his lecture, and then he couldn't go out to dinner that night. So one day he was running late to the airport and he said, oh, I'm gonna take one of those cars. He got down to the gate, he gave his lecture, he went out to dinner with friends that night, and he said, what the heck was I doing that whole time that I was priding myself? I'm having more fun now, so what's, you know, so it's just being able to kind of think in your mind what's important and what isn't. So here's some of the pharmacological management of M uh, MS for MS fatigue. Simitrel is an old antiviral. Um, it was used a long time ago for Parkinson's disease, and there have been several studies that show it helps with MS fatigue. You really have to take this at least twice a day, and it takes a while to build up in your system. It does work for some people. Um, it can dry your mouth, it can cause some constipation. Uh, so that's the downside. The modafinil, provigil, or now new vigil, or armodafinil, is a, um, it's not a stimulant, but it, it acts like a stimulant. And this is something that people can take as needed. So it's not something you have to take all the time. So some people say, well, I'm gonna use it Monday through Friday when I go to work. On the weekends, I'm not. Or on the weekends, I'm gonna take it because that's when I'm going out to have fun. So whatever it is, um, it can be used as needed. If you happen to be a young woman on birth control, you don't wanna take this drug because it does negate the effect of birth control. And then there are your stimulants, such as Ritalin, Concerta, Adderall, um, and those can be, be very beneficial as well. These are, as well as, well, the, the stimulants are controlled substances, so you can only get 30 at a time. So it's kind of a pain in the butt, because you gotta 
contact your provider every month to get it. You can forget to do it and then you run out. But these also can be used as needed. And then Wellbutrin and some of the SSRIs or the antidepressants can be stimulators in and of themselves because they release, they allow more serotonin to circulate in your body, which can help with fatigue. Um, and if one of the reasons why you're fatigue is because you're depressed, you're really helping it by taking an antidepressant. And then 4 otherwise known as Ampira, can also sometimes help with fatigue. There have been mixed studies about that, however. Some of the non-pharmacological management of fatigue, um, exercise, once again, it, reduces, it induces neurotrophic factors, which can really help with energy. Um, L-carnitine, turns fat into energy into cells. So there have been some small studies that show that this helps. They actually did a study, compared it to amantadine, which I talked about on the previous slide, and it was actually shown to be more effective than the amantadine. CoQ10, uh, we talk a lot about that at our center. Um, there's been a small study with that that is, helps with MS fatigue. It, has something to do with this ATP energy release, and it helps energy travel from cell to cell. So that could be a benefit. Flax seeds are omega fatty three acids, uh, and that may have an effect on the inflammatory response. And as I talked earlier in a previous slide about inflammation might be causing fatigue, so this might be helpful. And I don't know much about this transcranial stimulation. I've never had anyone do it other than for depression, but supposedly for fatigue, they put these electrodes on your forehead and it stimulates regions of your brain that help with energy. So there have been small studies that show this helps also with uh, MS fatigue. So what about depression? Very common once again, over the lifetime of the disease, and it can be extremely disabling. Um, there's about a 50% chance over a lifetime and a 25% chance per year that someone could get depressed. And probably the numbers are higher because oftentimes people don't share with their providers that they are depressed. Definitely can reduce the quality of life. Could be associated with some of the medications. Some of the older, the interferons were known to increase the risk of depression. Uh, and, but the great thing about it is it's very treatable when identified. So what are the symptoms of depression? Depressed mood, feeling of helplessness or hopelessness, negative thinking, not wanting to be around other people. I was seeing a woman who used to be a very vibrant person, um, very involved with her children, her grandchildren, and something just clicked, and she just didn't want to be around anybody, didn't want to hang out with friends, didn't want to be with her grandkids. And so she's slowly working on that, but it was such a change. Um, but it was examples of all this. Um, people might eat more or eat less if they're depressed, sleep better or sleep, sleep too much or can't sleep at all, and difficulty concentrating. This is where that loop of symptoms comes together. Cognition, fatigue, depression. So what are some of the possible causes? Uh, Dr. Rob Bakshi is at our center. He's done some studies with depression. So it looks like um, it is associated with MS lesions and atrophy. Um, that it also can be what's called a hippocampal volume in the brain and looking at reduced white matter might be contributing to depression. So if you think about the disease itself is a central nervous system disease, it's no wonder that it can affect how people feel in general. So there are scales that can measure depression. Uh, and once again, they're very time consuming and they are usually done in trials mostly. But there can be something that could be done in clinics very easily. And that's the two question uh, depression scale. And basically these two questions are taken from that DMV, how to diagnose depression scales, the first top two questions. And it basically just asks you about how you're feeling. Are you feeling hopeless or helpless? And this is something, I'm saying it to you all in the sense that this is something to think about when you talk to your provider, because they might not ask you, but if you think about these two questions, it might be something that you want to share the, uh, the answers with them. 
So we know that depression can affect quality of life, and to be blunt, it just sucks the life right out of somebody. I mean, so it, it takes every joy that you have if you feel depressed. And depression, you know, is a lethal combination. We know the rate of suicide has increased with uh, MS over uh, general population. So it's something to really, really pay attention to. Um, you can see this with uh, social isolation and increased alcohol abuse. Um, depression absolutely leads to reduction in adherence to medications. Um, so super important because you just might not care and you might not comply with doing it, but it's so important to stay on these medications. It also can affect cognition. If you're depressed, you're not going to process information that well. If you're fatigued, you can feel more depressed. If you're more depressed, you can not process information. So it's all a cyclical pattern. Caregiving, um, we know that the caregiving spouses has a six times greater incidence of depression themselves. So we try to pay a point. Uh, one of our old psychologists used to have a caregiver support group just because we know it affects not just the person with MS, but also their significant other. And we know that anxiety is a precursor to depression. So people who feel anxious, that's just a prelude to depression in a way. But who's not going to be anxious about MS, right? I mean, it's just facing that uncertainty. How will this... And how is it going to affect me? It can be very anxiety provoking. So treatments for depression. The Goldman consensus statement is something that was put out by the MS Society and a group of providers across the country. And basically their consensus statement was is that you can't just take medications. You really do need counseling and support uh, to work through this. Once again, the newer uh, antidepressants, is they're called your SSRIs, or bupropion, which is in a similar drug, or Wellbutrin. And counseling exercise, also super important. We know that once again, it releases those endorphins. It's going to make people just feel better. And then social support. And oftentimes, helping other people makes you feel better. And so that's an important thing. So there's this cyclical symptom interdependent dependent relationship between many of the symptoms. So one affects the other affects the other. So it's really important to, when you go into your provider and you have particular symptoms, you're not gonna treat everything at once. Focus in on the one that's the most important to you and see how it might affect one of the others. So potentially if you have bladder issues and you treat that and you're not up all night, maybe your fatigue will improve. If you treat the depression, maybe your fatigue will improve and your cognition will improve. So everything is interdependent upon itself. So I kind of look at treating MS as two trains on a track, meaning that you want to treat the symptoms and modify the disease at the same time. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm treating the symptoms, why do I have to take a disease-modifying treatment? Well, because you want to keep that disease stable and at the same time treat the symptoms if they're important to you. You don't have to treat, like someone will say to me, well, yeah, I have a fatigue, but I get through my day okay. Well, then don't take something, it's okay. You know, you don't have to take something, but just know that there's things available. So, what is resiliency? And this is where I liked what you said, Paul, that people have this capacity to really live beyond MS. And, and, and we're, you didn't come into MS being a 100% perfect human being who's happy and go lucky all the time. I mean, people have been faced with things their whole lives, but they learn how to overcome them and become resilient and be resourceful. And one way to do this is uh, to become resilient is by effectively communicating. And what does this mean? I think as a provider, patients oftentimes un have unmet needs. And there have been studies that show that people who do feel like they're making their own decisions or effectively communicating with their providers that they have a better outcome for themselves. And unfortunately, there have been some studies that show what 
myself as a provider thinks a person values is not the same as what they value. So we really have to pay attention and effectively communicate to have a two-way street in any of this. What a shared decision making is really based in patient-centered care. So the patient is the middle of the wheel and everything should focus on that it's an, and it goes back and forth between whatever provider you're seeing, whether it be physical therapy, occupational therapy, your MS provider, a speech therapist, your primary care doctor. And I think this is where shared decision making really comes into play when you're trying to pick a disease modifying agent or even symptom management because once again, I talked about earlier, that efficacy, that safety value, the uh, side effects, how it's administered is really important to communicate with your provider what you're willing or not willing to accept. So I think what it does is it elicits, elicits a person's values and goals. What, what, are, what, are the, what are people's expectations? My expectation might be different from yours. So this is actually a slide meant for healthcare providers, but you can reverse it around. So if you look at shared decision making and you spell it out, is seek your patient's participation. That's my job. Your job is to seek your provider's participation. Some people want to know everything. Most people who, who end up getting diagnosed with MS come in usually with globs of information. They know sometimes more than I know. So what are the expectations on both parties' part? Some people want to be a big part of their decision-making process, and other people say, you decide for me. And everybody has individual ways of dealing with their health care issues. How do you, to help, so, so for me as a provider, help your patient explore and compare treatment options. I think it's really important for the patient to ask questions. Always ask questions. People say, well, well, this is a stupid question. And I go, there's no such thing as a stupid question. You know, because if the more you ask, the more informed you become. And the more I would get to know what, what, what are you like as a person. I mean, that's what I need to get to know as well. And then shared values and preferences, you know, assess your patients. I need to assess, you need to tell me. I can't read your mind if you don't tell me. And work together to make the decision. Um, used to be a million years, I worked with this one physician. He was kind of a young punk, but he, he, he would said to me, you know, I really can't stand when patients ask me questions. I'm the doctor, I know better, I'm just gonna tell them what to do. And I was like, no, 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 that's not how it works. You know, people are consumers, you're a consumer, and you should be able to share how you feel about something and ask questions. This, it's, it, it's a, it is healthcare, but it's a consumer-driven business in a way. So you need, you have every right to ask for anything you want or to ask all the questions. And then to evaluate that decision together. Has this been a good decision? What I have to say, well, what are your goals? Do you think if you take this particular disease-modifying agent, your symptoms are all going to go away? No, that's not the expectation. You're still going to have your symptoms. The expectation is that you're not going to get any new symptoms. So there are some barriers to shared decision-making. Um, and as you can see here, it could be cultural differences. I think we have to be very mindful of that in our practice. Um, people have different values and goals on certain things, so that's really important. Family dynamics, you know, some person, you know, I'm the man of the family, I'm not supposed to cry, or I'm not supposed to be depressed. I, I mean, I have to be the one that takes care of my family. Um, so I don't share that information with my provider, so that's a barrier. Um, a person's level of education, you know, might interfere with how they understand how something works or doesn't work. Cognition, absolutely. If somebody doesn't understand, it's hard to make a decision together. And I talked about that denial of depression is a huge thing. So what can you do as a, a, a person with MS to participate in the shared decision making? So I think it's really, really important to prepare for your visit. Don't go in just saying, hey, I'm here. Really think about what you, what is your goal for that visit? Like, 
you have a half an hour, some, some people only get 15 minutes with their provider. What is your expectation of that visit? Don't go in and say, oh my God, I was caught in traffic for 20 minutes and that's what, don't talk or how's your kids, nice to do, but you only have a certain amount of time, make sure if that's what you wanna to do to talk about each other's kids, fine, but make sure that you, have, you walk out of that feeling satisfied with the appointment. So what has worked for you? What are your successes? And prioritize, know that there are time constraints. And if it don't get through everything in one visit, set up another one. I mean, that's totally, and you know, I know with integrated healthcare uh, systems, uh, at least at our place, it's called Epic, and you can message your provider. Uh, don't, for me, don't ask a lot of questions that take a lot of uh, conversation. I'd rather talk to you, call me on the phone. But for a simple question like, what was my MRI results? Or is this medication okay to take with that medication? Those are simple things that are, are easy to get done and won't take up time at your clinic visit. Stay focused. Really think about what you want to do, what you want to say, and what your goals are once again. Don't get off track and be realistic. I mean, sometimes the expectations of something, I, I was talking with a woman yesterday, and unfortunately, she's experienced something called trigeminal neuralgia, and I don't know if anyone here is here have ever experienced, but it's like the worst, worst pain in your jaw. They, they describe it as worse than childbirth, if anyone out here has had kids, but, um, and she's just suffering from it. I mean, it's just horrible, and we're talking, but unfortunately, it's a problem that it takes a while to remedy, and she basically said, so what am I supposed to do, just suffer? And I was at a loss of what to say because, yes, right now it is, but we're going to work on this together, and it is going to go away. So really being, being realistic about what, um, how you can help somebody and how, how you think your provider can help you. And setting expectations is super important. So this is my Be Hopeful slide. So this is from um, one of our old fellows who just left, went back up to Canada. This is his slide to just show that there are ongoing studies in many different venues. So some of the drugs that we talked about earlier, I talked about earlier, which were bioequivalent, they're uh, the same drug but just made a little differently. These are newer drugs that have def different mechanism of actions. And I put this up here not to talk about each one individually, but to say that there are so many new ones out there that it's very hopeful and the, the landscape for MS has gotten so much better. I mean, like I said, when I first started this, there were no drugs and now there's many drugs and now many people are working on many other drugs. And for, there's a new drug and I can't pronounce, ubibliximab, it's an anti-CD20 drug. That's gonna be coming out, maybe FDA approved at the end of December. Um, the difference with that one is it's an hour infusion as opposed to a four hour infusion. Um, but these are different mechanism of actions. And our, at our center, we're working on a medication called, of, um, L, L, how do you pronounce it? Elralumab. Um, but it's a nasal inhaler that is neuroprotective. It actually works on the microglia that I talk, talked about earlier. Because we know in MS, everybody has microglia, but because it helps the structure or the, the basis for nerve cells. But in MS, the microglia seems to be increased. So this drug decreases it, and they see that on what's called a PET scan. So two patients have been treated so far with this nasal inhaler for the last six months, and they seem to be stable. Uh, and they're gearing up to do eight more patients. So very new in the trial, which I'm sure we're not the only people. There's many of this going on throughout the country and throughout the world. But just to be hopeful that there's just other things out there coming along. Because so many drugs out there are really designated for early relapsing remitting. And when people um, have more progressive disease, that's where these drugs don't work as effectively. So it's good to know that people are working on other avenues of mechanism. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was a very nice discussion. Anybody have any questions in the audience? Good. 
My question is, if you are taking a high efficacy DMT, but you have a breakthrough on it, is it rational to go to, to switch to a, what you said, biosimilar or a less effective DMT? So it's an excellent question, and it's a really long answer. So it, one, it depends on what that breakthrough is, because none of the drugs are 100% effective. So you're going to have, there's a chance that there's going to be some breakthrough. Is the breakthrough a new MRI lesion? And is that new MRI lesion pretty big? Or is it in your spinal cord versus the brain? Is it a teeny new lesion in your brain that doesn't really cause any new symptoms? So that's a breakthrough. But it probably would still be worth go, staying on the same treatment that you're on. I know that's not exactly your question, but that's the background. So um, every, if, if, if we knew more about MS and everyone was the same, it'd be so easy to treat, such as if you have high blood pressure, you can monitor that by a blood pressure cuff. And there are different medications that are similar in how it works, but you can interchange them and they might be more effective than another because not, we're not all the same. But you can measure that outcome much easier so it might be that you go from a high efficacious drug to a less efficacious drug, but that mechanism of action is going to work better for you. So it really depends on also whether you have relapsing remitting disease or secondary or primary progressive. So the answer isn't simple. So that's why it's so important to talk to your provider and you as an individual, um, they'll know your history and you'll know you, and you can come with what, what seems to be the best way to proceed. I don't know if that answered you, but it's not easy. I'm sorry. Thank you. Question online asks, how long should somebody stay off of any medication when they're trying to switch from one to another? So also another good question, and it depends on what you're on. So there isn't one blanket statement. Some medications you can just switch from today to tomorrow. And that's okay because of the way they work. Other medications, you have to have a little longer of a washout period. Um, because of the way they work, it might suppress your immune system too much, so you want to let those cells come back. Um, so it really depends on what you're on, and that's, once again, talk to your provider and really come up with a plan. And that applies to taking a vaccination. I mean, Sherry was talking about vaccinations a lot. You know, because some people can go off of some of their CD... Uh, 20 depressants and then get their vaccination and then go back on after their um, uh, B cells come back. So there's a lot of different ways, not just talking about um, treatment changes or if let's say if someone's wanting to get pregnant, when to come off and things like that. Thank you. All right, next. You, you started to ask something earlier that you said is going to anger me if you do it. So do you want to ask it now? I do. Go for it. <laughs> So fatigue, this is why I always like to ask people, like, because it's so hard to describe, if anyone would be willing to share their fatigue experience, because it is so different from person to person. Hi, I, I just feel for me, it's like walking through water. Like, I just feel when you're so fatigued, like any movement, your arm, your legs, getting out of bed, it's just like threading to water, like deep water, neck, you know, into your neck, and you just, can't move as fast or as quickly. That's what my one of my biggest fatigue issue is. And so I'm going to put you on the spot. Does that happen to you all the time? And and do you have trouble describing that to others? I th I'm lucky. My friends really understand because I'm a very active person and I have a lot of energy normally. So they can see like, okay, there's something really off with her, and I know they have issues. Yes, I do. So if I need to go somewhere, um, she will come pick me up. Say, okay, I'll drive today. All right, thank you. Like it's, I'm just lucky in that situation. I've been very open like when I'm struggling, but it just, I don't always have it. It's just these days you wake up and you have to go to the bathroom because you know you have to go to the bathroom, but I'm like, do I really? Because I'm, I'm so tough to walk those 10 steps to the bathroom. And one more question. Did it take you a while to get to that point? I think some people have a hard time asking for help or setting limits or... Did, 
Oh, oh no, I'm very straightforward. Right. I just like, if I need something, I will ask you. So it's, for me, it's easy because I'm that person like, you've fallen down, okay, I'll come over and help you. you. You're all sick, everybody has the flu, I'll come do your laundry because you need clean sheets because everybody threw up. I'm, I'm just throwing stuff out there. So I'm not afraid to ask for help. And I think because I will help them, nobody has an issue when you ask, so. That's, great. That's really great. Yeah. Hi, so it's not really uh, describing my fatigue, it's more of how I measure my fatigue. When I was diagnosed, my son was seven, and he, always, he asked me one day, Mom, are you lazy tired or MS tired? So I, that's kind of how I think, when I think about it, I say I'm tired, I have to realize, and it takes ownership to myself, how am I really feeling? And I, I turn around and ask him, well, are you being lazy tired or you don't have MS, what can you describe? He says, I can be tired, tired, or I can be lazy tired. So whenever I feel myself being fatigued, I really take a look inside and realize, am I lazy tired or am I just a mess tired? And I feel that has helped me a lot with doing activities and moving forward in my life. And that was over 10 years ago, and it's still every day, I think about it. Can I ask you a question? So your son is now 17? No, my son is 20 now. 20, so I, when you said seven years or 10. So, and how did you grow up with him with that? You know, like, do you learn together? Just how you oh, We learned aunt? together, and he was so young when I was diagnosed that he knew it was every day was a different day. Some days I could do things, some days I couldn't. I was very open with him, with my taking my therapies, whether it was an injectable or not. There were times where I've had to, with side effects, I lost hair. So I've, I've, it was my personal choice, but I chose to shave my hair, to shave my head, because I wasn't, didn't want, I was going into depression. So I've gone through different phases in my diagnosis with many different therapies, and he was there right next to me the whole time. He shaved my head for me. So I've been very open and to his age level, right, to expect the different things. So he knows there's days mom can do this or days she can't. Or if something new happens, he's been very open with it. I've been very open with him that I'm okay, I just might need help doing different things. Uh, wow, that's, thank you so much for sharing that because that is so important. I have a question concerning fatigue. Has anybody slept a completely full night and you wake up in the morning thinking you never went to sleep? Yes, that's the way fatigue hits a lot of us as well. So. so, you know, I forgot to say something. This is off the fatigue track, but Alan, you mentioned something in your talk, which was wonderful. Um, I think one of the key things is listening. You know, this goes back to that effective communication that you, you listen to your son, your son listen to you. I need to listen, not only in my personal life, but at work, and really try to... I, hear what someone is saying as opposed to thinking in my head what they're gonna say to me. Like, have, everybody gets their own story. So I think listening is, you know, I sit, when I, and in the exam room, I get a half an hour with somebody, it takes 25 minutes to talk with people and five minutes to do the exam. So I think the most important thing is really hearing and listening to what people are saying. I, I have, um Recently, six weeks ago, I had major surgery, and prior to that, I work out like I am a gym rat. I go to the two gyms every day, the pool, um, and I ride a recumbent trike about 100 miles a week. And I did not experience any fatigue. Well, the last six weeks, I haven't been able to do that. I just started going back to the gym, and I have fatigue. Just to give an example, during the talk today, I actually fell asleep. And not well, you're because- You're not supposed that, to say that to me. No, not, <laughs> talk or my talk. no, both. Not because I'm not interested, but I'm fatigued. And when I'm exercising, and I tell everybody, exercise as much as you can without hurting yourself, but I exercise every day. And just to give an example, in 2021, I, ran, I rode over 3,000 miles on my recumbent trike, which, you know, and I never felt tired. Now I'm tired, and I don't sleep as well. I think I have to take it with me on talks. <laughs> Last one. I want to come off of your question. Um, how does MS affect your sleep? Because I just did done a sleep study that I didn't sleep through. So. I, 
I wasn't able, my doctor wasn't able to analyze the study because I didn't sleep. And this is my third sleep study that it, this happens. You were saying like, have you slept? Did you not think you were sleeping, but you really did sleep? So I don't sleep. I can go days without sleeping, maybe three hours in a You need to call me in the middle of the night then. I could. <laughs> so if they don't find anything like structural, like sleep apnea or things or restless leg, which sometimes they find. So there is a thought that with MS, it does affect people's sleep pattern. Uh, and there's been, you know, the research has gone down a little bit in that. And now it's picking back up. But it does, you know, think about it once again, central nervous dis disease. So it's affecting how your brain works. And that's part of that sleep process. So sometimes people have trouble falling asleep. Sometimes people can fall asleep and then wake up. So, or some people can't fall asleep at all. So it's, and, and it could be multifactorial. So looking at, and I'm probably, you've probably already done this, but looking at like, how is your mood? What's going on? Are you someone who, who ruminates when you lay down and it's quiet, all of a sudden thinking about everything that's been going on. I'm not saying that's you, but that's one of the possibilities that you can't, you can't turn it off. Um, our, our old psychologist used to do sleep health with people, really looking at many different reasons why that could be possible and how to, to, how to intervene. I mean, you know, the key things is don't, sit in front of, elect I mean, you've heard this, don't sit in front of electronics, only use your bedroom as some place to sleep or have sex, don't use it to watch television, and all those things that really keep up sleep health. And then certainly people can try different agents, I mean, probably the cleanest thing would be to do is take melatonin, because your body produces melatonin naturally. Um, it's hard when people start taking like the Benadryl or uh, Zolpidin and all those because then it's kind of got the habit of doing that and not really figuring out why it's going on to begin with. What if they take CBD for sleep? You know, actually people like CBD for that and find it because it's very relaxing. It kind of calms people down. I don't advocate smoking it. Um, using the tincture or using gummies, that oftentimes can help with quality of sleep. Um, also very good for spasticity. Uh, but you really need, sorry, I'm getting off track, but you really, there's a bug. You really need um, the THC component in that for the uh, spasticity. But yeah, CBD, thank you, Stuart, is a really a, a good option for sleep. Okay, I have a new question. I gotta stay away from this speaker again. Okay, regarding inflammation being one of the potential causes of fatigue and micro glia having a major role in mediating inflammation, is there a way to determine if Indeed, the problem lies in dysfunctioning microglia, and if so, is there a fix for this? Right, so that's a promotion for this new trial that my director of their center is doing, but the only way to measure microglia now is through PET scan. And PET scans are very difficult to do, they're very costly, so unless, it's not like a routine MRI. Um, and it, the machine breaks down all the time, and it's, but that's the only way that I know that you can truly measure microglia. So knowing that, you know, working on inflammation, such as, um, you know, some people say by not eating, I'm, I'm not professing this, but not eating gluten or casein or milk products, which can cause an inflammatory response in your gut can sometimes bring down that inflammation. Taking an antioxidant, such as flaxseed, that that can maybe potentially bring down the inflammation. Any other questions out here about anything to do with symptoms or otherwise? If not, we're completed. If not, we're completed. Thank you. So again, I want to thank everybody for coming here today and all for all those online as well. This is a Compass to MS Care program. We do this around the United States. If anybody wants to know, you can follow us by visiting our website and seeing all the locations that we are every month. Okay, this Compass to MS Care series was designed to bring MS education and resources to those in rural and underserved communities around the United States. So again, I want to thank you all for coming here. Everybody's in attendance today, and for all those online, thank you, and we'll see you again soon. Have a great day.